by tradition. In the foregoing pages, we have constantly had occasion to speak of tradition, of traditional doctrines or conceptions, and even of traditional languages, and this is really unavoidable when trying to describe the essential characteristics of Eastern thought in all its modalities. But what, to be exact, is tradition? To obviate one possible misunderstanding, let it be said from the outset that we do not take the word quote-unquote tradition in the restricted sense sometimes given to it by Western religious thought. When it opposes quote-unquote tradition to the written word, using the former of these two terms exclusively for something that has been the object of oral transmission alone. On the contrary, for us tradition, taken in a much more general sense, may be written as well as oral, though it must usually, if not always, have been oral originally. In the present state of things, however, tradition, whether it be religious in form or otherwise, consists everywhere of two complementary branches, written and oral, and we have no hesitation in speaking of quote-unquote traditional writings, which would obviously be contradictory if one only gave to the word quote-unquote tradition its more specialized meaning. Besides, etymologically, tradition simply means quote, that which is transmitted unquote, in some way or other. In addition, It is necessary to include in tradition as secondary and derived elements that are nonetheless important for the purpose of forming a complete picture, the whole series of institutions of various kinds which find their principle in the traditional doctrine itself. Looked at in this way, tradition may appear to be indistinguishable from civilization itself, which according to certain sociologists consists of, quote, the whole body of techniques institutions, and beliefs common to a group of men during a certain time, unquote. But how much exactly is this definition worth? In truth, we do not think that civilization can be characterized generally by a formula of this type, which will always be either too comprehensive or too narrow in some respects, with the risk that elements common to all civilizations will be omitted, or else that elements belonging to certain particular civilizations only will be included. Thus, the preceding definition takes no account of the essentially intellectual element to be found in every civilization, for that is something which cannot be made to fit into the category known as quote-unquote techniques, which, as we are told, comprises quote, those classes of practices specially designed to modify the physical environment, unquote. On the other hand, When these sociologists speak of quote-unquote beliefs, adding moreover that the word must be quote, taken in its usual sense, unquote, they are referring to something that clearly presupposes the presence of the religious viewpoint, which is really confined to certain civilizations only, and is not to be found in others. It was in order to avoid all difficulties of this kind that we were content at the start simply to describe a civilization as the product and expression of a certain mental outlook common to a more or less widespread group of men, thus making it possible to treat each particular case separately as regards the exact determination of its constituent elements. However that may be, it remains nonetheless true, as far as the East is concerned, that the identification of tradition with the entire civilization is fundamentally justifiable. Every Eastern civilization taken as a whole, may be seen to be essentially traditional, and this follows directly from the explanations given in the preceding chapter. As for Western civilization, we have shown that it is on the contrary devoid of any traditional character, with the exception of the religious element, which alone has retained it. Social institutions, to be considered traditional, must be effectively attached in their principle to a doctrine that is itself traditional, whether it be metaphysical or religious, or of any other conceivable kind. In other words, those institutions are traditional which find their ultimate justification in their more or less direct, but always intentional and conscious, dependence upon a doctrine which, as regards its fundamental nature, is in every case of an intellectual order. But this intellectuality 
may be found either in a pure state, in cases where one is dealing with an entirely metaphysical doctrine, or else it may be found mingled with other heterogeneous elements, as in the case of the religious or other special modes which a traditional doctrine is capable of assuming. We have seen that in Islam, tradition exists under two distinct aspects, one of which is religious. It is upon this aspect that the general body of social institutions is dependent, while the other aspect, which is purely oriental, is wholly metaphysical. In a certain measure, something of the same sort existed in medieval Europe in the case of the scholastic doctrine, in which Arab influences, moreover, made themselves felt to an appreciable extent. But in order not to push the analogy too far, it should be added that metaphysic was never sufficiently clearly distinguished from theology, that is to say, from its special application to the religious mode of thought. Moreover, the genuinely metaphysical portion to be found in it is incomplete and remains subject to certain limitations that seem inherent in the whole of Western intellectuality. Doubtless these two imperfections should be looked upon as resulting from the double heritage of the Jewish and the Greek mentalities. In India, we are in the presence of a tradition which is purely metaphysical in its essence. To it are attached, as so many dependent extensions, the diverse applications to which it gives rise, whether in certain secondary branches of the doctrine itself, such as that relating to cosmology, or in the social order, which is moreover strictly governed by the analogical correspondence, linking together cosmic existence and human existence. A fact which stands out much more clearly here than in the Islamic tradition, chiefly owing to the absence of the religious point of view, and of certain extra-intellectual elements that religion necessarily implies, is the complete subordination of the various particular orders relatively to metaphysic, that is to say, relatively to the realm of universal principles. In China, the sharp division we have already spoken of allows us to observe a metaphysical tradition on the one hand and a social tradition on the other, and these may at first sight appear not only distinct, as in fact they are, but even relatively independent of one another, all the more so since the metaphysical tradition always remained well nigh exclusively the appanage of an intellectual elect, whereas the social tradition, by reason of its very nature, imposed itself upon all without distinction and claimed their effective participation in an equal degree. It is, however, important to remember that the metaphysical tradition as constituted under the form of Taoism, is a development from the principles of a more primordial tradition, formulated in the Yi King. And it is from this primordial tradition that the whole of the social institutions, commonly known under the name of quote-unquote Confucianism, are entirely derived, though less directly, and then only as an application to a contingent sphere. Thus the essential continuity between the two principal aspects of the Far Eastern civilization is re-established, and their true relationship made clear. But this continuity would almost inevitably be missed if it were not possible to trace them back to their common source, that is to say, to the primordial tradition, of which the ideographical expression, as fixed from the time of Fohi onwards, has been preserved intact for almost fifty centuries. We must now follow this general survey with a more detailed consideration of what really constitutes the special form of tradition known as religion, and we must also explain how pure metaphysical thought is to be distinguished from theological thought, that is to say from conceptions in religious mode, and furthermore how it differs from philosophical thought in the occidental sense of the word. It is in these fundamental distinctions that we shall discover, by contrast with the chief types of intellectual or rather semi-intellectual conceptions, current in the Western world, the basic characteristics of the general and essential modes of Eastern intellectuality.